Oh, um, thank you again for the invitation to talk here. And uh, I just want to start with a brief overview of the structure of this lecture series. And then we will actually go into the actual introduction to, to the topic of models of homotopy type theory. So um, before we can talk about models of homotopy type theory, it's quite clear that we need to talk about models of type theory. And I've decided to also do this in this talk and not assume that you're familiar with models of type theory, because I know that there are some people in the audience who come from a categorical background and who have not yet worked so much with type theory. But fortunately, we had Andre talk earlier this week about uh, type theory. And when he introduced type theory, everything he said, you could actually read a verbatim as a definition of model, as long as you take care to interpret the um, so-called equality judgment as actual meta-theoretic equality. And uh, well, there are some technical details involving how you treat variables, but if you do it in a nice way, then you actually end up with a definition of model and you can use that. But we will adopt a categorical approach and try to try to treat it in as mathematical a way as, as possible, um, sidestepping syntactic issues such as um, handling named free variables and such. Um, Right, um, then after we have done that, and we will actually make this precise using the so-called notion of categories with families, we will look at the first main non-trivial example of a category with families, which is um, called, well, it's a class of models and they are called pre-sheaf models. And it's a very well known and very, very useful interpretation of uh, type theory and not just ordinary Martin Love type theory, actually um, an extensional variant of it that uh, satisfies equality reflection, um, interprets in these pre sheaf models. And we can use this to make the description of models of type theories and type formats a bit more elegant, as well as use it as a bootstrapping device to define the actual models that we are going to be interested in later on, the models of HOT. And HOT is a very different theory from from type theory with equality reflection. So the types are not going to be the same, but we can use it in a useful manner as a bootstrapping device to avoid having to recheck many of the type formers or at least um, parts of the type formers. And then uh, we will have an exercise session. Um, I decided to only have two exercise sessions, but make them a bit longer. Um, after feedback, um, after the previous, well, day one, um, and um, I have selected a couple of um, exercises in here. Uh, we will mention them during the talk. And it's probably more than you can do in half an hour. So you're free to, to choose which exercises you want to work on and uh, group up in ways that, well, mean that you work on the same exercises. So since we're using Zoom breakout rooms, this probably means that we will give you permission to, to leave and join. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe designate uh, different rooms for different exercises. No, I don't know. Or maybe you just, um, this is something I will discuss with the organizers in the break. Um, and then in the second half, we will actually look at what the title of the talk says. So models of homotopy type theory. And um, the main part of this will be um, an analysis or a presentation of the so-called simplicial model of homotopy type theory, which was discovered by Vladimir Vavotsky, and this was like a groundbreaking result because it was the first known model of univalence. And well, I suppose it was actually developed in you know, lockstep with the actual notion of univalence. So uh, it's kind of there since the beginning of the topic. And then if we have time, we will look at uh, cubical models. Um, I want to say that um, it's a lot of material for just uh, three and a half hours or three hours if you, you know, if we leave the break and I guess it's only one and a half hours or a little bit more of, of lecture material, maybe one hour, 45 minutes. So I'm going to be available also tomorrow morning from um, 10 to 13 uh, local time to, to engage in in-depth discussions and answer questions and so on. So if you're interested in this, uh, in the model side of type theory, then um, yeah, um, we can cover any part of this material in more detail in this time. Okay. And lastly, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask in, um, in, in the Zoom chat. 
and I've already seen some questions, uh, one of which was about meta theory. And Eckbert actually already answered this. So by meta theory, I just mean the ambient um, mathematical context in which we analyze a model of type theory or models of type theory. And it depends on what upbringing you have, basically. If you, I don't know, went to classical school, I guess, uh, maybe your ambient uh, context is set theory. If you're a type theorist, then your ambient context will be some version of type theory. Uh, but uh, all of what I'm saying is written towards the classical mathematician's viewpoint. So I write set. And you know, if you want to have a type theoretic meta theory, then you have to replace set by type and be sure that your type theory is rich enough to, to support all the constructions that, that we use. And oh, I'm a very quick, quick if, if, if you're doing you know, old fashioned maths, then, then you, would you have no uh, equality, no paths other than uh, idents? In the meta theory, yes. Um, so traditionally, we work in a setting that has, if you're a type theorist, uniqueness of equality proofs. And if you're a set theorist, then the question doesn't even arise. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why univalence was discovered in the context of type theory and not set theory. But uh, if you take, you know, if you do a lot of work, then probably you can transport much of what I'm going to discuss also to a univalent meta theory. But, uh, well, that's topic of current research probably, but it follows the typical line of, um, you know, seeing H sets as embedded in all types. So you can still talk about sets within univalent mathematics. Okay, um, enough answers to the same question. Um, Let's start with the introduction and overview. Um, so I already said quite a bit of this, so we can skip over most of it. Um, so the slogan for me, at least, for a model of type theory is that um, all the, the judgments that uh, Andre talked about, for example, the judgments that, that something is a type or that something is a term, they are now replaced by um, by a structure such as for every context, we have a set of types in that context. And for every context and a type in that context, we have a set of elements or terms in that context. And uh, when Andre made a distinction between different terms that are beta eta convertible or judgmentally equal, um, we are not going to make that distinction and we just treat them as actually equal. So the uh, judgmentally quality judgments get turned into actual um, equalities. And every rule that uh, Andre had turns into an operation. So for example, the rule for forming a pi type turns into an operation that takes an element of the set of types over context gamma, an element of the set of types over context gamma dot a, if a refers to the previous type, and returns a new element of the set of types over gamma. So everything turns into sets, operations, uh, traditional mathematics. And um, there are many frameworks for models. Um, I, I believe probably more than 30. Um, and uh, there are actually slight variations depending on how close you want them to actually correspond to the syntax that Andre um, introduced and how close you want them to be to an algebraic notion, a set level notion, or alternatively a, a categorical notion. So um, having a bi-category of models that is. And um, I tried to list here all the dimensions according to which uh, these models could differ um, that occurred to me when I was writing this slide, but there are probably more. So this is uh, only important for those people who already know the terminology. We are not going to explain every little bit here because of lack of time. But um, um, one important distinction, for example, is um, whether you take terms as a primitive concept or whether you take the context projection maps of context extensions. So the context maps, the substitutions from gamma dot A to gamma as primitive. Uh, this, for example, would be the distinction between categories with uh, families and categories with attributes. And uh, another distinction is uh, whether the model is contextual or democratic or not. So contextuality, for example, as we will later see, I guess, 
means that um, contexts are just are not just an opaque um, opaque objects, but you can actually inspect the structure of contexts and discover that they are telescopes which are built from the empty, empty context um, using uh, iterated context extension with types. And uh, we will not go into the discussion of split versus non-split models. We will only treat split models in this entire series of talks uh, to cut off, to cut out like an hour of lecture material. <laughs> and uh, that means we will treat the collection of types over any context just as a set. So in some notions of models, you go a bit further, you treat them as a, as a groupoid or, or a category even, and then you uh, separate the inter interpretation of syntax um, via a separate step where you you somehow make a choice of substitutions, which uh, which is strictly functorial. So this is called uh, splitting a model. But as I said, we will only work with split models. So you don't need to think about all of this. So our choice of model for this talk is categories with families. And I've selected it because it's extremely close to Andre's syntax. And it's also a very nice notion of model. Um, and we will see the definition later. So. That's uh, models of type theory, but what about models of homotopy type theory? Well, Andre spent actually most of the introductory section of his talk just talking about models of type theory or dependent type theory. And then he said, well, in homotopy type theory, certain additional principle, principles hold, uh, so function externality and univalence. And uh, well, since we can express function externality and univalence as types, um, well, a model of type theory becomes a model of, of, of homotopy type theory if we have terms, elements inhabiting the interpretation of these types in this model. So um, any notion of model of um, type theory automatically induces a corresponding notion of model of homotopy type theory, which is just those models for which univalence or the type, uh, the interpretation of the type of univalence happens to be inhabited by some term. Um, Right, um, models morally the same as denotational semantics. Yes, exactly. Um, right, history of models of hot. So, um, so uh, okay, I included here the set model, and I only did this because there is a little, little, tiny bit of univalence which you can discover in the set model, which is you can you can kind of build a univalent universe of propositions. Isn't that nice? To at least have univalence for propositions. If you're a classical mathematician, uh, the host has spotlighted your video for everyone. I hope he didn't take over my computer or something. No okay. worries. <laughs> um, right, so um, if you're a topos theorist, for example, you know about the subobject classifier, which is a univalent universe. But even without um, impredicativity, we still have a universe of propositions that is univalent it, it it's just not uh, small uh, of course we need to restrict to small propositions if we want to form a, an actual set here but i will conveniently ignore size issues in this talk as always um okay next up in the ladder uh, was the groupoid model by hoffmann streicher in 1995 i believe and this was actually the first non-trivial model of univalence or restricted univalence, I should say, because, well, univalence, and it wasn't called univalence back then, it was called something else, uh, uh, can be made to hold for sets in the groupoid model. So you notice we are always moving one level up here. So the set model can have a univalent universe of some propositions, and the groupoid model can have a univalent universe of some sets. Um, note that these are not actually the H sets in the groupoid model, but the strict sets, the actual sets. It's not possible, I believe, to, to have a univalent universe of homotopy sets in the groupoid model. Um, so in principle, one could think of moving up one by one even further, but people have not actually been able to turn two groupoids um, presented algebraically or three groupoids or whatever into a model of homotopy type theory. So um these uh, so-called algebraic models of um, n groupoids they don't appear apparently uh, tend to be very very good for for interpreting uh, type theory in in them so um i don't know who looked at this but i thought about it briefly and 
I don't see any way of making the two groupoid model work with an algebraic definition of two groupoids, but this could be a topic of research, or if you're interested, you could you could think about it a little. Um, and then um, nothing happened for like 10 years. And then Boyvotsky came with his breakthrough insight of, you know, univalence. Uh, and uh, he didn't just discover the uh, univalence axiom and its consequences. He also provided a justification for it in the Simplicia set model. And this was like the, the breakthrough model theoretic results um, that we can actually uh, justify univalence um, in Simplicia sets. And if you don't know what Simplicia sets are, it's a combinatorial model for, uh, for spaces um, or infinity group points. And we will later see uh, more details on them. And this is the first model that supports full univalence, so which has a uh, which has universes or a hierarchy of universes, and all of them satisfy univalence, not just restricted to sets or groupoids and so on. Um, this was all good, but it was non-constructive. And um, that means that Wojewodski had to use um, the axiom of choice to build this model. And um, many people thought um, about giving a constructive justification for univalence. And this was finally achieved by Kokor and co-workers. And this um, led to a series of cubical models of which I believe there are three families, um, probably some, some hybrid versions or some generalizations as well, but these are the three flavors that I'm aware of. And uh, the uh, first flavor is the BCH model for um, Besem, Kokor, Huber. And uh, this was, um, I don't know, 19, sorry, 2000, I don't know, 15 or 14, maybe, I don't know. Um, so this justified univalence and it had, uh, it, it was computational in the sense that, um, that terms actually reduced to canonical values in the empty context. So in principle, you could use it for, um, for computations as well, not just for proofs. Um, so one interesting thing is that um, this model can actually be shown not to model spaces. So even using classic logic, it's not equivalent to uh, simplicial sets. And uh, well, we would really like to have such a model because infinity group points are supposed to be the standard model of uh, univalent type theory or hot. But um, the development didn't stop there. So the next flavor of cubical model was the so-called connection-based flavor, um, also known as uh, CCHM style models uh, for um, Kokor. Um, uh, I don't know how to pronounce Siren. Um, Cohen, yeah, sorry. Kokor, Cohen, uh, Huber. Mertberg, and uh, one of these authors is actually in the uh, in the uh, in the audience, I believe. And uh, for this model, it's not known if um, if it is equivalent to spaces or not, um, even classically. And uh, in contrast to the previous model, it's actually a family of models. Um, so this was just for a particular pre-shift category. This is for a family of base categories. And then lastly, though, there is a the newest kind of cubical model, which is called Cartesian cubical models, I suppose, or I would call it the Cartesian-based favor. And um, here you don't need the so-called connections. Maybe we will have later time to talk about them. And in fact, uh, there is a known model which is equivalent to spaces, the so-called equivariant model. So this Cartesian-based model is due to ABCFHL, which is Anguli, um, V, um, Anguli, well, C is Cocon, Favonia, um, uh, six authors, I always mix them up. Um, uh, Licata. Um, They're in the chat, don't worry. Bunnery, um, yes, and Hoover as well. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, um, I will add um, 
references and links to, to the uh, lecture page so that you can go back to the original lecture if you want. Um, so this is the constructor story. And it doesn't end here because actually we don't just want to interpret uh, hot in, in spaces. We want to interpret hot in what people call an infinity topoi. And um, there are lots more infinity topoi than uh, just uh, the base model of spaces. Um, and um, in the classical world, uh, there has been some progress recently, primarily by Mike Schulman, who managed to find for each um, infinity topos. So I mean it in the non-elementary um, sense, so every Grotendieck infinity topos, uh, a presentation in terms of a certain uh, model structure, simplicial model structure, for um, which has as vibrations, injective vibrations in simplicial pre-sheaves, um, which presents this infinity topos and also supports interpretation of homotopy type theory. So this is a groundbreaking result, which says that we can actually use at least classically homotopy type theory as the internal language or N, let's say N internal language for um, infinity topoi. And uh, classical mathematicians can be happy with this, but what's still lacking, I suppose, is a story of uh, constructive theory of infinity uh, topoi and uh, corresponding constructive interpretation of of homotopy type theory in them. Um, I guess we don't have much more time to talk about this. Well, uh, I said this, but now there is another slide about exactly this topic. And I suppose I said most of this already. So here are some technical um, things to be aware of. Um, one says one would like to use homotopy type theory as an internal language for infinity topoi, but well, type theory doesn't directly interpret into infinity categories. Inter it interprets into, into one categories with certain, let's say, homotopical structures. So for example, categories with families with uh, certain type formats like identity types that satisfy certain things. So this is a one category, not a higher category. It presents a higher category, but uh, this distinction is important. So it's kind of like uh, model categories. If you're a homotopy theorist, you can use one categories with homotopic structure, like model categories, to talk about the higher categories they present. So the higher category would be the localization of the one category at some at some set of or class of weak equivalences. So it's always a two-step process. First, you choose a suitable presentation of your higher category in terms of a one category with a sufficient structure to interpret type theory in, and then you interpret type theory in that thing. So if you actually unfold what you get in the infinity category, depending on what kind of presentation you choose, this can be less involved or more involved. Um, uh, what do we mean by model spaces? Um, yeah, so good question. Uh, classically speaking, I just mean um, a model of type theory whose presented infinity category is the same up to equivalence as the infinity category of spaces. So um, the presented infinity category of a model of type theory is just uh, the higher category that arises as the localization of the, let's say the fibrant or the core, the fibrant um, fragment of the CWF. So all the telescopes you can form of the empty context um, at the uh, homotopy equivalences. So this only makes sense if you already know some infinity category theory, but um, this would be the definition. And you can make it a, a constructive definition as well by um, giving a constructive treatment of uh, simplicia sets or semi-simplicia sets and observing that, and also infinity categories and observing that you can still define the infinity category of, of spaces as modeled by, let's say, uh, simplicia sets or semi-simplicia sets with the uh, corresponding right notion of weak equivalence and then demanding a uh, model of type theory, which is constructively equivalent to that. But this is a, this is a in-depth question. So let's uh, skip over this for now. Um, yeah, the rest I already covered. So Schumann had this groundbreaking results and um, it hasn't been used as much as it should be now, but it is very, very recent. And I believe that, you know, this is, uh, this is probably, um, this is going to be a central result. So anything that you prove in, in homotopy type theory now is a statement about infinity topoi. And this was conjectured only for a long time, but now finally proven, at least classically. 
Okay. Um, so I used 30 minutes for the introduction, even though it was supposed to be 15 minutes. So I can extrapolate that. I guess we will end at uh, eight. Um, but let's just um, continue. Uh, don't worry about the references. I will add them uh, after the talk. I didn't have time to, to give a full list of references before the talk, but I will add them later. Um, so this was just a high level overview. And now we will actually go into some details. And don't worry if you were not able to follow many of the details so far. Um, we are going to start, start from scratch and from the ground up. So all you have to know is a basic uh, knowledge about categories. What is a category? What is a functor? Um, adjoints, um, you need a lemma. Um, just, just this, basically. And um, let's start again with the notion of model. So when Andre uh, gave his talk, he, uh, he stayed at a quite syntactic uh, level where his contexts, his, his lists of hypotheses was actually pairs of variable names and types. But I want to avoid uh, these syntactic issues with variables because uh, I don't think this is an intrinsic feature of, of models. This, is, this belongs firmly on the side of syntax. And uh, for this reason, we want to develop our notion of model in a way that avoids referencing this, this concept of variables, or at least named variables. And um, whenever we have a context, uh, like a list of hypotheses x1 until xn, which are inhabitants of certain types, we see this as an object in a certain category the category of contexts and substitutions. So let's just write C for this category. And um, this category also has morphisms. And the morphisms are given by substitutions. So syntactically, a substitution from this context to this context, and I hope you can see my mouse cursor, is just an assignment of um, you know, terms using the variables y1 to ym for, for the uh, variables x1 and xn of the context gamma. And uh, so we, um, we abstract over this by just starting with an arbitrary category C. But the intuition is that this should model context. Later on in the model, it might not actually be the case that all the contexts are of this form. Maybe context is something completely different. But at least later on, we will be interpret. We will be able to interpret um, telescopes like these or the empty context as as objects in this category, and that's all we need. If you want the objects to actually be in bijection with such lists, you need to, to work with a so-called contextual notion of model. For example, contextual categories or or categories with families that are contextual, or I don't know B systems, C systems. I, I never know what is which, but uh, probably C system for card mail, contextual, I don't know. Um, right, so next, every context gamma, which now we just think of as an object of the category C, has a set of types. So we write this as types of gamma, it's just a set. And um, as Andre also mentioned, types can be substituted. So if you have a substitution between two contexts in the type over context gamma, we can get the substitution of this type, which is a type over delta. And we write this as A with these square brackets, um, sigma. That's the substitution. And this is a strictly functorial operation. So if we substitute twice along two um, composable substitutions, it's the same as substituting along the composite substitution. Um, right, same for terms. The only difference is that uh, terms additionally depend on a type. That's, that's basically the, the intuition for, for how our models are going to work. We're going to give a precise definition soon. Um, let me briefly look at the questions. Um, some history, OK. Um, when we define an inductive type, do we worry whether the given, whether a given model is broken? Well. If you want to have inductive types in your model, you need to prove that they exist. So otherwise, your model does not um, support inductive types. Mm. Yeah.
Yes, and there are combinators for inductive types like W types as well that you can use instead. Um, okay. Right, so um, we had here the notion of um, sets of types that depend contravariantly in the context, and that's what people call a pre-sheaf. Um, so I assume that you know this, but I'm just going to review it very briefly. So a pre-sheaf is um, just a contravariant functor from the category into the category of sets. So C op into set, and that's the traditional definition. But um, there is an alternative definition, which is also quite useful, which we are going to review here. Um, so first we write C hat for the category of pre-sheaves over C. So the morphisms are the natural transformations. And um, if you know a bit of category theory, you might have looked at the Rotendi construction. And in this case, uh, it's a restricted version. Um, it's um, basically, well, let's start with a functor from pre-sheaves into categories over C. So these are categories E together with a functor into C, which sends a pre-sheaf F to the so-called category of elements of F. And um, when we say category E over C, um, for most of this talk, we, we are going to um, regard E as a so-called displayed category over C. That is, we, well, we have the perspective of E as just a category by itself, and this map is just a functor, but we can also apply the equivalence between sets and a map into set I and um, a family of sets indexed over I here to see um, this E as, well, a family of objects E0 of A for every object of A. So that's all the objects living over the object A in C. So all the objects which are sent to A strictly. And then similarly for the morphisms, a set of dependent morphisms which live over a given morphism in C and have given endpoints X and Y. And this is cool because now, uh, for example, we can strictly re-index um, displayed categories um, over C. So this was not possible before. Um, so um, take it as just categories over C. If you're a classical, well, let's say a traditional mathematician, if you're a type theorist, you probably are used to thinking about this index perspective where everything is indexed over the base in some way. And then in this index perspective, we can very easily describe this category of elements as an indexed or displayed category. It's just objects are objects well, objects are f of a, and well, there is a morphism from x to y over f if x is actually the substitution of y along f. So this is the truth value of this proposition. So it's subterminal at most one element. Um, so it happens that this functor from pre-sheaves to categories over c or displayed categories over c is fully faithful. So we uh, treat this as a one category, not a two category. And uh, we can characterize the essential image of this functor as the so-called discrete vibrations. And I try to draw a picture here like uh, Andre had in his talk. I'm emulating him. <laughs> um, so if you think of the base C with the morphism A to B and uh, the category E over C and assume that we have a lift of B, which we call Y, then there should be a unique lift of everything else. So a lift of A and a lift of F. I try to indicate this in this picture. And that's what's called a discrete vibration. It's kind of a lifting condition. And it's very similar to the transport pictures that Andre had in his talk, but it's directed because we're talking about categories. So in this case, you can only transport um, reversely backwards. And um, it happens that uh, discrete vibrations are sometimes a better model for pre-sheaves than just functors from C up to set. And if you work with higher categories, you will be very familiar with this because um, higher pre-sheaves are much more easily described as the higher analog of discrete vibrations, which Lurie, for example, calls right vibrations. All right. Um, that's what we're going to need to know about pre-sheaves. Mm, it's fine if you prefer to work with this version, but later on we will we'll use some of this notation. Um, now we can finally give our definition of model of type theory in the form of category with families. And we say, 
It's basically what we had discussed so far. It's a category C uh, terminal object, which models the empty context because uh, there is a unique substitution into the terminal context, into the empty context from every, every other context. Appreciative of types over C and then appreciative of terms over the category of elements of the appreciative of types. So that's that has as objects uh, context together with a, a type in that context, exactly what we want. And note that these pre-sheaths, they, they capture the substitutional action. So we don't have to speak separately about the action objects and morphisms. We just say pre-sheaf and that's done uh, very compact. Um, but that's not all because we forgot about uh, the very important feature of context extension. So in um, type theory, we can extend contexts iteratively by types. So, you know, we can, we can start with the empty context and then have a telescope of types over it. So how do we model this operation? Well, it turns out the context extension satisfies a universal property. Um, mapping into an extended context from another context is the same thing as mapping into the unextended context and then giving another term in a correct context of a certain type, namely the type that you extended with substituted. And uh, categorically, this is uh, the following statement. We have a pre-sheaf over um, the slice of C over gamma, which sends a map, a map a sigma from delta to gamma to the set of terms in context uh, delta of um, A substituted by this map and we ask for a representation. So we ask for this pre-sheaf to be representable. And um, if you're not familiar with this terminology, I've unfolded it here for you. So representation is the same as a terminal object in the category of elements of this pre-sheaf, which is the category of tuples delta, sigma t, where delta is an object of C. Um, sigma is a map from delta to gamma and t is a term in context delta of A substituted by sigma. So a terminal object, well, we fix a notation here for it. It's conveniently denoted gamma dot A because the extended context is actually going to be this object. And then PA for the forgetful map from gamma dot A to gamma. So we also call this the context projection map or the display map. And lastly, um, QA, which is the generic term which witnesses that in context gamma dot A, we have an inhabitant of the type A. Well, we have to substitute it. Uh, we have to weaken it by this last occurrence of A. It just says, well, we have a variable of this type, so we can use this variable to inhabit this type. And this, this weakening operation is the price we have to pay um, for not using named variables. Uh, this is basically like working with the Brian indices, but um, semantically, it's much easier to handle than variables. Um, right, and terminality means that for every context delta with a map sigma into gamma, which also has a term of type A substituted to delta, well, there should be a map from delta to this uh, chosen terminal object, the context extension, um, which makes this triangle commute and which makes T the substitution of the generic term along this dashed map. So. I've written here angle brackets um, to give a notation for this extended map because we will have to use it in the in the SQL. So this is our notation for extending a substitution for for building a, a substitution into an extended context. So just uh, use the original substitution into the first part, and then you have to give a term of type A in context uh, delta, and well, you have to substitute A by sigma to make it live in context delta. And this is all. So we didn't treat typeformers so far, but except for typeformers, this is the notion of model, everything. And uh, well, okay, let's not talk about this algebraic aspect here because of lack of time. Um, one thing that I want to mention and which is actually the first exercise is that um, context extension is actually just a property of the pre-shift TM. It doesn't really have to do with types. So thinking of TM as a pre-sheaf over uh, the category of elements of types, we can phrase context extension in a way which, which does not 
look at C um, or types, but only at the projection map from the category of elements of terms to the category of elements of types. And it just so happens that context extension is the same thing as a right adjoint to this uh, forgetful map. So I've written here um, the pre-sheaves in the form of discrete vibrations. So um, we have C, the category. We have a discrete vibration of types over C. Maybe you would want to write this as category of elements of types. If you start with types as just an ordinary pre-sheaf. And then a further um, pre-sheaf or discrete vibration um, TM over TY. And you can also regard the category C, of course, as being um, as living over uh, the terminal category. And then the terminal object is just a right adjoint to this map, and context extension is a right adjoint to this map. So in this way, you can express the notion of CWF purely using the notion of discrete vibrations and right adjoints. Um, and for the categorically minded people, that can be an exercise. Uh, show that this notion unfolds to exactly what we said on the previous page. Uh, so this is something you can work on during the first exercise session. OK. Um, there was a question. I'm not going to go into all this new pull stuff. Um, is the reference that given a category of families explicitly constructed type theory out of it? Uh, yes, probably, but I would have to look it up. Um, there is also much more general work by Taichi Omura in, uh, about this, who, who has actually generalized the notion of category with families to, um, to something parameterized by so-called representable map category that abstracts over these, these maps that have context extension. So that allows you to actually um, have as parameters um, uh, discrete vibrations for which you want to have um, context extension. So maybe not just terms and types, but also the interval in cubical type theory, for example. But let's not get into this. Um, yes, uh, the set model is precious over one. Mm, OK. Uh, sorry, now, could you explain again what type of mathematical object term is? Right. So. Um, terms is a term is a discrete vibration over types, but when I write term here, I actually mean the total space, the category of elements of this discrete vibration. So I mean TM, maybe the most precise way to say it is as a displayed category over TY. But um, depending on how you want to read this diagram, well, it depends on whether you want to read it in an indexed way or a traditional way. So in a traditional way, 1, C, T, Y, and T, M are all categories. And all these arrows are just discrete vibrations, at least the ones pointing downward, while the bottom one is not a discrete vibration. Mm. And then these are just ordinary adjunctions. Or you can think of it as um, displayed categories. And then everything above is fibered, um, or indexed, rather, over the thing below. Um, Just to uh, clarify, the terminal object is just the empty context, right? Here? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's treat uh, type formers. And I've already run significantly over time. So let's hurry up. Um, so I'm not going to go into very much detail here, because actually everything I'm saying here was already in Andre's talk, as before. And uh, all I've done here is replace his weird type theoretic magical symbols by traditional mathematical symbols like element hood and you know sets. So all I'm going to say here is for dependent sums, well, for any context, every element gamma of our category, any type A over gamma, every type B over the context is tangent of gamma with A. We have another type in context gamma called the sigma type. And because we don't work with variables here, I just write it as an algebraic operation. So it's really just an operation. We call it sigma of A and B, which um, comes further equipped with a bijection between the terms of this type and the set of pairs of first a term of A and then a term of B, where we substitute the term A into the type of B to make it be a type over gamma. So here we have to use these angle brackets to construct a substitution, for example. 
Um, yes, and uh, um, in the previous slide, if you think of types not as a category over uh, C, but as a pre sheaf you would have to write the category of elements of types. Um, okay. And uh, then we have pairing and projections, and they actually just maps back and forth between these two sets. And the beta and eta rules that Andre had in his talk, they are now actually qualities and so instead of uh, these, these weird uh, judgmental qualities, and they just witness that these two functions are uh, inverses to each other. And then there's a last annoying condition, which we always have to state that um, this everything we have stated so far is natural in gamma. So this construction sigma of A and B is compatible with substitution. And also this isomorphism is natural in gamma. And then for dependent products, we can do the very same thing, only that this time the terms of the pi type are in natural bijection with the terms of B in context gamma dot A. So type theoretically, um, this is just mediated by abstraction and application or maybe evaluation to be precise. So if you have a term of type B under a hypothesis of A, you can use lambda to turn it into an element of the pi type. And then, well, you can evaluate this pi type. For example, you can apply it to the generic term of type A in context gamma dot A to uh, get a term of type B in context gamma dot A. And this is also a natural bijection. So this is how you would state I guess in simplest terms, but not the shortest possible terms. We will come to this later, what sigma types and pi types are. And beta and eta are just two sides, two equalities of you know, saying that these two functions are inverse to each other. And um, if you're a more syntactically minded person who is new to models of type theory, then I would challenge you to translate your syntactical weird symbols for um, identity types and all the rules involving them to just standard mathematical language in terms of CWFs and write down what it means for CWF to have identity types. So that's uh, the second exercise. And you can choose uh, which one you want to work on first in the exercise session. Um, all right. Um, I want to mention, oh, there's a question. I'm sorry, I'm going to run significantly over time. And the objects of um, the category of elements of types are pairs of an object in C and a type over it. Yes, exactly. That's the category of elements. Mm -hmm. And yes, identity is the identity at gamma. Um, right. So um, because I'm going to because I'm speaking about models, I have to mention also a different perspective on on these type formers, which um, is closer, cl more closely related to um, to the categorical operations of um, left and right joints to, to pull back. Namely, um, if you um, switch to a different point of view on terms, so that's written here in blue, um, terms of type uh, A in context gamma can also be seen as uh, sections to the context projection map from gamma dot A to gamma. So those are maps from or substitutions from gamma to gamma dot A, such that when we project back to gamma, we get the identity. Well, and what is this? Well, it's just a term of type A because uh, the remaining part of the substitution is specified to be, you know, just copying the variables in gamma, if you think syntactically. And at this point of view, we can equivalently characterize sigma types and pi types also using diagrams in the category C. So for example, for sigma types, a very quick way to um, write down the isomorphism that we had before, the bijectional sets, is to use the category C and say that, well, we have a natural isomorphism between the context extension of gamma with a sigma type and the iterated context extension with A and B. So if you just think about these so-called display maps, these context projection of types, then sigma types are basically just ways of making a telescope of types into a single type, as you probably know. And um, they satisfy um, a property which very much, very much looks like um, an adjunction. So I've written it here, maps from a sigma type 
um, into some other context delta can be seen as maps from B over A into the context uh, delta extended with the substitution of A. And for pi types, we have exactly the same property, only that pi is on the right instead of the left. So it's uh, mirrored. And these kind of say that uh, sigma A is left adjoint to um, taking the pullback along the context projection for A and uh, pi A is, uh, so taking the pi type with um, first argument A is right adjoint. But uh, there are some caveats, uh, namely that this holds true only after switching to the so-called display map presentation, where we need to take care that sigma A and pi A are not actually defined on all maps. They are only defined on those maps which came from types. So in fact, the precise way to phrase this is probably that sigma A and a pi A can be seen as uh, relative left and right adjoints, relative to um, the functor that turns uh, types into into a context over the current context. And then you really have to regard categories as types, um, not just as sets, where the morphisms between types is just given by morphisms of the uh, context extensions over the current context. But yeah, we don't have time to go into these details now. And uh, there's also a categorical perspective on identity types. Um, I've written here a diagram. Um, so I don't have the time to go over this. I don't know. So you can look at this if you've done the exercise for um, defining identity types or saying what it means for CWF to have identity types. Um, so whatever you do, if you uh, adopt this so-called display map point of view, so instead of terms, you speak about sections of maps and try to phrase everything in the category of context, then the elimination rule for identity types should correspond to a lift in a certain square. So see this as part of the exercise. If you phrased the definition of identity types in the CWF, then check that it corresponds or the elimination rule corresponds to this lift which I've drawn in this diagram. And this uh, is actually closely related to what will occur later on in the simplicial set model where we will see the connection between identity types and weak factorization systems which are characterized by lifting conditions like these. Okay. Um, Lastly, um, the universe, and I'm not going to talk very much about it. Um, it's just a type U in every context, also natural in the context. And because of this, we can actually simplify and just say it's a type in the empty context. And then a decoding function, which we can phrase as a type, which depends on gamma extended with U, which um, has the job of turning elements of the universe into actual types. So the function that sends a type, an element A of the type U to the substitution of this type EL along this substitution, this is the actual decoding function. And um, well, you don't have to follow all these details now, you can go back to them later, but you can check that this actually defines the so-called induced CWF structure on C, where you uh, replace the uh, original types by another notion of types, which is basically elements of the universe. And uh, this then forms a new CWF structure with all the previous structure copied. Um, so in particular context extension and the terms are also just the original terms, but the types are restricted. And you can use this device to give a very, very slick definition of what it means for a universe to be closed under type formers. Namely, you can just say that this induced CWF structure needs to have those type formers. And if by closure under type formers, you, you also mean that the decoding function preserves these type formers, you can just say that the, uh, the map of CWF structures that we have from this uh, induced CWF structure on U to the original CWF structure, that this preserves all these type formers. So there's a morphism of CWF structures with type formers. And you can go further and model hierarchies of universes and whatnot, but we are not going to do it here. And as I said before, the axioms are just uh, witnessed by, by certain terms. So whenever you have an axiom, fun x or univalence, well, the model supports this axiom if there's an inhabitant for, for the type uh, that expresses the axiom. And if the type um, has uh, you know, um, types as input, for example, functional extensionality speaks about a type A into type B, 
then, well, this axiom better hold naturally in the current context to fit into this framework. So that's it, I suppose. I've included a few examples here that I just thought of when I wrote this. Probably there are better examples. So the most important CWF is the CWF of sets. And uh, the types over context gamma are just sets indexed by the current set gamma. And then terms are uh, uh, dependent sections or sections if you form the uh, total space of uh, the total set, so to say, of this type. So for every element in the base X, an element of the fiber, just like in Andre's talk uh, where he had pictures for this situation. And then you can do the same thing for groupoids. And there is actually a, a subtlety here. Uh, it's not quite clear what to take for the types. You can take uh, functors from the current context gamma, which is a groupoid, into the groupoid of groupoids. But um, instead of this, you can also regard groupoids as a two category or a bi category and look at uh, pseudo functors from gamma into groupoids. And uh, well, this is the first one is the so-called split vibration model. And uh, the original version of the groupoid model is uh, given by Hoffman and Streicher. And this, this other version is something that uh, Schumann, for example, has written about in, um, in his article on inverse diagrams of inverse diagram models of homotopy type theory. Um, so this was, again, the first model of type theory which supported univalence for sets. Um, can yeah. I ask a question about uh, the universes from before? Because uh, you only mentioned one universe here. How do you yes. add a hierarchy of them? OK, so there is someone who wants me to talk about it. But be aware, it takes two minutes. So you can iterate this process. So let's say you want to have um, a universe U1, which contains everything that, you, that universe U contains, but also U. And let's call this U, uh, U0. Then you already have the notion of CWF with the universe U close to type formers. And then you can say, OK, we have a CWF. Uh, we suppose we have a universe in it. And we suppose that this CWF structure of the universe that is induced by it in this process has all the type formers, including the type former of a universe, and then say that uh, this morphism preserves all these type formers, including the universe. And in this way, you get a hierarchy of two universes. And if you iterate this process, you get a hierarchy of n universes. And there are various ways of taking the, the limit, so to say, or the, I suppose it's rather a co-limit. Um, and uh, one perspective is actually to to switch to a relative point of view where you don't have an absolute notion of type anymore, but rather a notion of type of size n. And then you can have a universe un such that the elements of un correspond exactly to the types of size n. And instead of just a single global CWS structure, you now have a, um, a stratified hierarchy of CWS structures. So you would phrase your notion of model no longer in terms of a single CWF, but rather as an ordinal indexed, perhaps a diagram of CWF structures on the same category. And um, that's how, how I would do it for a, for, um, for, for a linear hierarchy. There are also versions of universes where you don't insist on a linear hierarchy, but have axioms such as for any finite collection of maps there is, or a finite collection of families, there is, there's a universe which classifies everything. And you can also phrase this using using CWFs. So there are various approaches. And it, it's not actually something that has to do with the models themselves. This is something that is just translating whatever syntactic idea you have for your theory into the corresponding language of talking about it in the model. Um, all right. Um, does that work for impredicative universes too? Uh, yes. I mean, for an impredicative universe, you just have different rules. Um, so to make a universe impredicative, you have to um, add additionally um, these impredicative pi types. And you cannot talk about them as just pi types in the CWF structures induced by you, because, well, it, it is a mix of um, large quantification, so quantifying over something which is not in you, uh, into something which is in you, which is supposed to live in you. So um, you have to 
yeah, okay, you, you have to switch to a version of PyTypes where you make a distinction between the sorts where the domain and target live. Um, oh my God, so many questions. I hope this is due to the amount of material and not to my, not because of my failure of explaining things properly. Um, Ty is a pre-sheaf over what category? Set or something else? Well, in the set example, it's a pre-sheaf over sets. So set is the category of sets or small sets if you insist on being precise. And here types is a pre-sheaf over groupoids. So when I say set as a model or groupoids as a model, I always mean to take this, whatever it is, as C, as the category of context and substitutions. Uh, exactly what Andre said just now. Oh, really? That's very helpful. Thanks. Yes, I should have probably said that. So sometimes when you speak about CWS, you just refer to the underlying category and treat this as, you know, the name for the CWF or, or what you refer to it by and you leave everything else um, implicit. But of course, it's uh, dangerous because there could be several CWF structures on the same, same category. 